Um, so there, there's a, a way I kind of describe embodied peacemaking. So first we think about what are the different ways of you know, doing conflict resolution. So like the things that come to my mind are things like nonviolent communication, doing active listening, calling a timeout, you know, all of these things that it's pretty, I don't know about easy, but come on, come on, we're just getting started. But they're, they're tools you can learn for um, dealing with conflict. And the problem I see with those tools is that so often when conflict arises, we get really stressed and all of those tools just vanish from our minds. We can't think even something as simple as I want calling a timeout. A lot of times is something you, you can't you can't access. Right. So the best way for me to describe the embodied peacemaking is it's a practice of being able to calm yourself so that you can engage in conflict in a way that um, is effective. So the analogy is, is that if you have tools, embodied peacemaking is the capacity to find your tool belt when you need it. Mm. Yep. Oh, oh, here's one thing I wanted to mention. So I didn't, I, this is gonna be participatory, right? So these are gonna be active. I didn't want anybody to worry about writing down information or capturing what I'm saying. So I have my notes. If you look on the website and you go to the presentation, there's a link. So you'll get a copy of all my notes. So you know exactly what I'm saying. So you don't have to write anything down. Thank you. Okay. So on my notes. Um, so one of the first things I say is that we can't learn this in an hour. This, this is a, so I set this objective to say, I really, what, you, what I want to do is be able to teach four key concepts and a practice. Now the practice is called centering. And I'd say that the, the, the practice of centering is probably one of the most useful practices I've ever learned. It's core to the whole embodied peacemaking. So if you get nothing out of this, but you learn the centering practice, then to me, it's a success. Okay. So that's the objective. Hopefully I get there about halfway through and then we got some, some bonuses on the other side or we can take it any way you want to go. All right. Um, embodied peacemaking is taught through a, a series of interactive exercises or um, really think of them as movement experiments. We're doing experiments to learn something about what's going on inside us. All right, so I'm going to start with um, a definition and because um, it feels like if we're going to talk about peacemaking, we should talk about what is peace. So the first thing I want to say is peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is the condition in which conflicts are resolved in respectful, life-affirming ways. So if we're here, it's not that like, oh, we're avoiding conflict or that we feel pretty certain that if conflict erupts, we're going to take it outside or we're going to bring in a professional. We're sitting in, no, it's like, hey, I have this trust that if something happens between us, we're going to handle it. It's going to be handled in a way that's respectful and really honors both of us. That's what peace feels like. Okay. Yeah. Um, one last already one. Yeah, yeah. Um, how would you relate this concept to, I might broaden peace, be like, just peace in my life, you know, regardless of whether there are other people around or not in any moment, but just like um, when I think about that sense of peace, like when I go to bed at night, you know, do I sleep peacefully? Like, do you see connection? Do you see the one would lead to the other? Um, well, I think it, we'll find out that this becomes like so central that it can be applied almost anywhere. But think about it, it's like if you can have a sense of peace in your body, in embodied peace, right? Then you're carrying that everywhere. And that becomes like a foundation for confidence. If you can bring that to any conflict, then, you know, that's like a, a, a sense of reassurance, right? Um, and so to me, that's how you, you start to build out the peaceful life. You start with a peaceful body. If you don't have a peaceful body, you know, you're just gonna have insecure peace. To the title of the workshop. Right. <laughs> okay, so concept number one. 
Oh, this is not my writing. There's no this way. handwriting is <laughs> awful. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Carrie? It's horrible. No, That's this is, Sophia. This is my okay. daughter. She is a, a graphic design major. Ah, well, and she thinks that she, she thinks, thinks that's terrible. She thinks it looks terrible. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, so this was developed by um, Paul Linden. Paul Linden, who has been studying Aikido for over fifty years, he's an Aikido master. Right. Um, Let's see, do I want to talk? So the thing about, uh, so um, I'm going to define Aikido. So Aikido is a martial art. Um, I don't know how much, I think I've got more to say about it later, but I'll, I'll go ahead and go in, into it. So when you're teaching Aikido, there's often like this attacker and defender, right? Aikido is different from all the other martial arts as far as I can tell, because it has no offensive maneuvers. It is 100% defensive. The goal of Aikido is when you're attacked to make sure that no harm comes of you and no harm comes of your attacker. That it ends without anybody getting injured. So, so that's a foundation. So he's always working with its attack and defense. That's what we've developed in, in this, this process. We think of challenge and response. Life is full of these different challenges and responses. Now the challenges could be external, they could be literally somebody attacking you, they could be somebody verbally attacking you. Um, it also could be internal, like the challenges, the challenging emotions that arise in you. So it's like, we need to distinguish how do we respond to these challenges and in having different responses, we have more power. So this is this related to the concept of being responsive rather than reactive? Right, like you could say that, um, but, but it's, it's about how we practice, right? So if you want to be responsive rather than reactive, well, how do you get there? Well, we can talk about it. I can give you lots of descriptions, but unless we practice being challenged and feel your response and start to figure out different ways of responding, then it's just an idea. There's no, it's just like, it's just like the, you know, the, the tool that we talked about that goes out of your head once you're um, once you're stressed out, you know, if you haven't figured out how to make it happen in your body, so we have to do the challenge and response. It's kind of like the foundation of all of these, um, you know, movement um, experiments. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go into my first one. It's going to be a demonstration. We're going, to, we're going to start with the demonstration, and we're all going to do the next one, okay? Um, so that means I need a volunteer. Oh, wow, you are really quick. Yeah, Harry's, okay. oh, Harry's quick in almost every session I've been in. Harry's like, I'll do it. <laughs> Must be the improv that we're doing. Yeah. 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 So we need a challenge, right? And we need a challenge that's enough to create some level of stress. But we want to pick what is the least challenge that will generate something you can feel, right? Because if we make do something too stressful, now we're out of the zone where you can learn, right? So we want to pick a minimal challenge. So here's the minimum challenge. I'm going to tell you what it is, and you tell me if you feel safe doing that, okay? So the challenge is, I'm going to take this tissue and I'm going to throw it at you, okay? Is that acceptable? Yes. All right, so uh, one of the things is like this, in doing any of these exercises, like a contract for safety, that you feel safe in this, this exercise, okay? So what I'm gonna do, if you wanna stand, that'd be helpful. I'm just gonna throw the tissue at you, and your job is to see if you can distinguish just what happened inside. Like, what was your response, okay? And we'll get a couple of chances at it. You'll examine, I'll watch, and everybody can watch, and see what, can, what do you see from the outside, and then what do you feel from the inside, okay? <laughs> what did you notice? Um, definitely, I think surprise was the first one. It was very, I uh, very rapid, and just the rest of your presentation has been very slow and gentle so far. And then sudden increase in speed was shocking mm -hmm. in some way. Okay. So, so I observed that there was a flinch. Yeah. Right. It observed. To me, to be like a little bit of a contraction inwards and back back it up. Right? Maybe even like a 
a momentary holding of your breath. Did anybody else observe anything? Um, you, when you started talking about um, going to it, he started doing this with his thumb and finger. Like there was almost like a, you could see the stress building in this like fidgeting and then, and then back to it. So you notice here, like your response was like surprise, yeah. And then you kind of talked about some of the mental, like the thoughts that came up, yes. right? So I'm going to give you, I'm going to do it again, and see if you can notice more like what what was the the physical reaction, right? It might feel a little bit different now that you know what's coming at you, right? Uh, yeah, that's when you have blink. Now that I was more prepared, maybe I feel almost like a reflection, like a meeting coming to meet it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you felt that side of your body, not this side, but this side contracting. Yeah. Okay. So, so now I'm going to do a little intervention, right? So probably what you weren't paying attention to your tongue at all. all right. So I want you to move your attention to your tongue. Just notice how like how tense your tongue is. Right? See if you can just maybe relax that a little more. Like even let it hang loose in your mouth. We hold a lot of tension in our tongue. A lot of times we don't know that. And then also I want you to notice how your tongue is connected to your throat. So the moment you relax your tongue, let it hang loose in your mouth, your throat starts to open. Feel less tense. And bring that down to your chest. And allow your chest to soften. And as your chest softens, you know, maybe your breath has a little bit more. And then notice your belly. And if you're holding your belly in, or if your belly stays still as you breathe in and out, just allow your belly to go out as you breathe. So a soft belly. So what I'm doing is I'm calling this like just a soft core, holding a soft core. And so we're going to just do it again, but also just like hold the soft core. Oh, does that, does that feel different? Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, I definitely had, I felt like I had less of a physical reaction. I still blinked, but I didn't have as much tension in like, my hands. Um, I didn't, yeah, I didn't do the contraction. So there's, in one way to think about it is like, you know, obviously the, t the tissue can't hurt you, right? So what are people responding to when they flinch? Most time it's they're responding to all the other times something's been thrown at them, you know? So when it's creating this soft core, not only are you more relaxed, but you're actually responding to the present. You're not responding to all your past conditioning. You're more what you did just now is an appropriate response to getting a tissue thrown at you. Now, let's move on to concept number two. But first, so I did this intervention. Would you describe that intervention as mental, emotional, physical, or spiritual? I'd say primarily mental. Primary mental. And really seeing attention now with the intervention. The, the, the soft yeah. core. Yeah. Physical. Physical. Yeah. Physical. Any, any other? I would describe it as like, you know, physical meets emotional. Mm -hmm. so the combination of physical and emotional. And you said well, mental. Like primarily. Probably mental. Any other opinions? There's a little bit of uh, spiritual there with huh? like the connecting to the body mind, especially the tongue, and feeling safety in the throat. So, so here's what I would argue. This is the premise, is that it was all of them, but because there is no separation, that we're dealing with a, a, a single organism, and that those four things are, are not separate. In. What is separate is our language. You know, we use physical language, we use emotional language, we use mental language. It's our language that's different. 
all talking about the same thing. So I could have, I could have said, hey, could you like open your throat chakra and just let it shine, let that, that energy through, right? Or I could say, hey, I want you to imagine something. I want you to imagine the softness in your core. You know, do, I could give you a mental instruction, you know? I could have given you an emotional instruction. I said, don't be afraid, right? Don't, don't, don't feel, you know, like don't, uh, what is it? Don't be afraid of the ball, right? <laughs> Great advice. <laughs> but what I did is I gave a physical instruction, right? And so that's, that's our principle number two. Body-based operational language. If we use body-based operational language, we can give clear instructions that people can follow because they all have bodies. And we can point to these bodily experiences, even if you're not sure, we can say, okay, let's experiment. Let's feel this in our bodies. And therefore, like advice, like, hey, calm down, or don't be afraid of that, we can turn it into something operational that you actually can follow and feel the result. Okay, one more concept here before I move into us practicing this as a group. Okay. So, so just the, yeah. uh, this concept, the example, instead of saying calm down, would be... Pay attention to your tongue and let your tongue relax. Feel how that affects your throat. I'm giving you physical body based, like it's operational. It's a thing that you can do. And then that gives it like more power to, to change your responses because you actually have a way of following the instruction. Okay. So we kind of got two concepts that we've achieved. So state dependent learning. So state dependent learning basically is like, hey, if you learn something in this environment, it's going to be a lot easier you to recall when it comes up in the same environment, right? So if you're learning some technique while things are calm and non-stressful in the classroom, you know, like, hey, maybe we're giving you instructions on how to shoot criminals, right? You get on the street, it's time to shoot. It's just all, it's, it's, it's a different state. You didn't learn it at the same state. So if our goal is to be able to respond effectively when we're really stressed, right? Then it's important to learn what we're going to do when we're really stressed. Which leads us to the second one, which is calibration. Calibration, right? So I was kind of calibrating. I said, what's the least amount of stress I can apply and it still feel uncomfortable, right? You could, it's enough that you can feel it, but it's not so much that you can't learn. So in the calibration, we're always trying to find that zone but as you master that, and as we add more, maybe you can master higher and higher levels of stress to the point where if we're calibrating, we can get you to the level of stress where you're learning, yes, yes, I have this tool, I can do this, so that when you're out in the world getting the same level of stress, you're like, ah, oh, I can recall this, I can feel this because I've learned under those conditions. So I'm going to do the same thing, but we're going to do something a little bit different. We can practice throwing tissues at each other if we want, <laughs> but um, we have an even number. So if we could pair up, and I want each person to stand across from your partner a comfortable distance. And maybe we'll, we'll set a line like right here. So if you two are on each side, like so we're Everybody's facing each other. I'm just no, right. Right. Oh, I, I was like, there was not okay. an even number. You got right. some really weird looks for me. <laughs> okay. All right. I mean, so, does everybody feel like the distance is comfortable? Because, you know, that's a little, it's a little negotiated thing, right? Thing. Mm -hmm. What's comfortable for each one? So, everybody feels this is comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, we're going to do something that's challenging that makes you uncomfortable. And you're just going to notice what is it you felt, okay? 
So now bring it to an uncomfortable distance. Step really close to each other in a way that feels uncomfortable. This is cute. This is actually frowning. <laughs> Is only mildly uncomfortable? I don't know if you already said uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, this, this is uncomfortable. <laughs> so, so notice inside your body, what is it that's uncomfortable? Interesting. Right? And, and here's a clue. If you can't locate it in your body, then maybe you, it's not a feeling. Right? Yeah. Like, actually, that, that closing of this is maybe too. Like, oh, I'm feeling this contraction in my chest or my jaws tighten up. Something's happening in your body that feels uncomfortable. That's how I know it's a feeling. Um, let's just, I'm, I'm so, so let's just step back. Oh, yeah. Step back and be comfortable. So can anybody describe what happened inside their bodies? What did they feel? Uh, I instinctively closed my hands. I could feel like core contraction a bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 My face like back a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. Nervous laughter, I think. Like yeah. Throat, especially in throat. Mm -hmm. Uncertainty where to look. Like yes. I, like was like, I, I don't know where to put my gaze. Yes, now. I have a really hard time when I'm up really because I can't focus on somebody's face when I'm really up close. I found like the part of my body that felt like closest. So I, I'm also shorter than Harry. Um, yeah. But yes, yeah, so, like my head was like under the chin. And like literally, like the crown of my head was just like, you know, tingling or like. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, so I gave that intervention, which was the soft. So I'm going to give two more. We can layer them if you feel like maybe that's too much to remember at a time. Okay. So so let's try let's just doing the soft core. So I'm going to repeat that. Like so, notice how your tongue feels. Allow it to hang loose in your mouth. Notice how that affects your throat. That open throat, your chest. We will include the breath. In that opening of the chest, that softness of the chest, just allows a gentle breath to hang out. And then notice, are you holding your belly in? You know, most of us socially are kind of conditioned to always keep that belly a little bit in. And that keeps it from going out when you breathe. Just feeling that soft core. And step in close. And just notice this. Yeah, and maintain eye contact. Mm -hmm. Even make eye contact, but felt like that. Right? Interesting. It, it felt actually felt not uncomfortable, and then I felt his hand like start to touch my stomach, oh. and like I felt uncomfortable again. <laughs> and then I was gonna, like, I don't want to say use the word force. Uh -huh. I'm just like soft core again, yeah, and then right. away. Again. Yeah. yeah, no, I definitely felt different. Okay. All right. So, um, so this might seem. Well, let me do another. This is easy, okay? You may not feel it too much because for this intervention. But, like, you know how you said, look back, right? You kind of turned a little bit. Oftentimes, when we're under stress, we lose our balance, right? We're, we're hunched one way, the other, right? We may be tilted in, we may be tilted back. So finding your balance, feeling that balance, is a is a really core kind of like centering maneuver. You know, when you are balanced, your ability to respond effectively is heightened. You know, if you're if you're leaning in any one direction, your ability to move in a different direction is reduced. So being balanced, and there's there's also I think this is the thing to notice, is that these things when you change your body. Because of what we were saying, it does change what's happening mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So just having, like, let, let's do this real quick. Go ahead and punch over. Right? And maybe slosh to one side. Now bring it back up. Find that center. Notice 
notice that there's something that shifts for them? I get it, like depressed when I'm in here over there. Kind of more natural when I stand up. Mm -hmm. I'm also noticing that if you become aware of the fact that oh, when I get when I get stressed, when I get defensive, when I'm angry, I'm I'm, I'm coming out of balance. Then the moment you're aware of it, you're going, oh, but going back into balance is so easy. And then there's a shift inside. Whereas if I said, stop being so angry, you'd be like, stop telling me to stop being so angry. Yeah. Right? Tell me what to do. But kind of like coming back to balance is a lot easier. That's operational language. I'm trying to figure out if it's easier or harder to do this with Jane because. She's just generally like easy to be around, mm -hmm. so it's like hard but for me if, to think about being rough. If you're if you're not feeling challenged enough, mm -hmm. like you're not getting the calibration to feel it, you can always ask to switch with somebody else. It feels more more challenging. Um, so, are you you want to practice balance plus soft core, or do you are you ready for the third one? I can do the third. Okay. So, this at first may not seem operational or physical. But let's just try this. So, look straight ahead. That's operation. All right, move your eyes to the left. And then move your eyes back. And, and I'm asking you to move your eyes without moving your head. Okay? Now, I'm going to ask you to move, keep your head forward, keep your eyes forward, and just move your focus to the left. Move your focus back. Was everybody able to do that? Mm -hmm. Barely. Challenging, but yeah. It was a lot easier because you're on my lap. I felt bad for you. <laughs> yeah. I I could kind of do a, this thing a little bit. But you can't like change where your attention is going, even if you're not changing where your eyes are moving. I noticed that my peripheral left vision is getting a little more filled in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, one of the things that you might not know, but is pretty universal, is as we get stressed, our focus has a way of collapsing, almost like in tunnel vision. That person is right in front of me that's yelling at me. I only see them, nothing else. Maybe I only see their mouth. So one thing, we try this, we can, if, if you find it easy, we'll keep going. There's, there's techniques, because some people have struggle, right? But think of like your your focus or your awareness is like maybe a bubble around your head. And just continue to expand that until it reaches and fills in this whole room. And you're holding this room. Your focus is in the whole room. The whole room is filled with your awareness. That's why. And maybe you might find a, a place where it's hard to stretch beyond, but just stretch in a way. your experience of why that uh, focus? It's hard to get very, very sleepy. And hearing more other sounds coming. Now the sleepiness, does that feel like maybe you're dimming your awareness? Like, hey, I've stretched something and you're getting you're getting a pushback, you're not getting more awareness. I start to get a lot of pain like in my cheek area and then my TMJ kind of a thing, mm -hmm. clenching your jaw. Maybe it just felt like things started to get very tense. So one thing I just want to point out is like we have habitual ways of being. Right? So you might find that your default is holding a certain level of tension. Right? Your default might be holding yourself off balance, potentially because you've experienced so many you know different stretches stresses. So you didn't quite come back to center again, right? That there may be a habitual way of like, oh, I'm gonna keep myself small. I'm not gonna take up too much space. When my focus widens, there is a sense of like, oh, I'm taking up more space in the room. 
So some people will have a reaction, right? That they're like, oh, this doesn't feel comfortable at all, right? This is now feeling stressful. This is, this is something different is happening. Right? So what we call that is like a, a somatic opening. Right? So we don't have the time to work through a somatic opening, right? Um, but just notice that that may be a possibility and there may be some things to work through and release before you can kind of do the full thing. But um, we're going to try putting all three together. Okay. I feel like I'm, I'm skipping something. Let's see what's under here. Ah, concept number four, somatic awareness. What we're training is ourselves to have some somatic awareness. And, and we've got four dimensions of somatic awareness that we've pointed out so far. Muscle contraction, and it could be anywhere in your body. Postural alignment, breath, and focus. So these are all dimensions of our somatic experience. There's more, but these are the dimensions that we've identified. Okay, so that's what we're really training is this somatic awareness. Okay. So here is the practice. So the practice is centering. To help us, we think of it as A, B, C centering. So A is awareness, or that expand focus. B is balance, and C is the soft core. Okay, so let's see if we can put those three big things together and step in uncomfortably. Is B also B? Yeah. Actually, is let's make actually... B breath and balance. There we go, double B. It's actually a lot cooler than the other ones. My backs are hot. I just, I don't worry about that. So just allow that awareness to expand to the place that's comfortable. Feel that balance. Allow easy breath, holding breath, and a soft core. Discomfort, we can step back and have you back. Why? I can give you like a bonus soft core. So, one way to have your core just be a little bit softer is imagine something that makes your heart smile. So, if you've got like a picture of a baby, a puppy, someone you love. Right? You feel that when you, you, that thing that makes your heart smile, there's just like an extra softening, an extra warmth in your core. <laughs> All right, so that was the thing. ABC centering is the practice. So we just remember the, the, that practice. I feel like that's something that's really valuable. It's made a huge difference for me. So I want you to think about there's three possibilities for when to practice. So one is when nothing stressful is going on, when you're just getting up from your desk, when you're walking to the refrigerator, when you're going for a walk, when you're, like just we talk about that default, like where you hold the default. The more you just practice it, anytime it occurs to you, that starts to change your baseline. If your baseline is more this centered place, then anything that comes up on you unexpectedly, you're already going to be in a better position to respond to. And one thing I want to say about centering is that a lot of times we think of relaxation. But relaxation can be like, oh, I'm going to sleep, I'm going to laugh, and I'm just So there could be like a collapse, and then there could be a, ah, a tension, right? But what we're doing is we're in the center, which is like this really awake and ready for anything place. 
you can be very centered and have your heart racing. You're still like, okay, whatever's gonna happen, I'm ready for it. So, so that's first just practice whatever occurs to you when things are nice and calm. Okay. The second place is when you're thinking about something stressful, you know, hey, this thing is coming up, I've got this difficult conversation, I've got this thing, I'm thinking about it, I'm anticipating it. Okay. Practice that. Then you can say, all right, let me take it down a few notches. Let me center and let me think straight. Then I'll be better able to think about it. In fact, a lot of times that will take you over the hump from, oh, I was thinking about this thing, I was anticipating this thing, I decided not to do it. Well, if I could feel good enough thinking about it, then I could probably take that step to actually go and talk to that person, you know, to knock on that door, make that phone call, you know, whatever it is that's the challenge. And of course, the, the third one is when it's happening, right? This is the hardest one to remember, but if you've been practicing the other two, your ability to fall into that centered place when you're under stress. And if you've practiced, now we haven't done it, but if you did practice under stress, then it's going to be that much easier. But even if you never learn anything else about this, you can still, doing those first two things makes it much more likely it's going to be available to you when things are, are getting tough. Also, here's the weird thing. I've seen this over and over. And maybe you experienced in your life. The thinking about it is worse than the doing. And that if we just got good at thinking about it and not letting it stop us, then we do a lot more doing because that's the worst part. Very much. And a lot of times the doing is kind of two different little things. The things that happen unexpectedly to us and the things we choose to do. Well, it ends up, most of the time it's the things we choose to do or the thing, you know, or didn't choose to do or the things that we regret. Those are the things that we need to summary. So thinking about it and then choosing to do it, that can be like really life changing. I really appreciate like when you said centering, mm -hmm. you don't have to be calm. Because like when you're having a panic attack, it's like right. I need to be calm, I need to be calm, but if you, if you if it's okay to not be calm. Yeah. Be right. It's, it's, you could be centered and not calm. So Quick, quick story. I had to get an MRI, right? They put me in the thing, right? It was like, I swear it was like the end of the guy's shift. He's just in a hurry. He straps me down, puts the thing on me, presses a button, and I start going to the tube. And the tube is narrower than my shoulders. And I start getting squeezed, and I squeeze, and I squeeze, and I'm getting further in there. And I start having a panic attack. I'm freaking out. Now, they're supposed to give you like a button, they're supposed to prepare you for what's going to happen. Sometimes they give you a cloth to put over your eyes or a mirror. There's all kinds of tricks. He didn't bother with any of that stuff. And so I went into it and I just started screaming. And I didn't know if anybody could hear me. I didn't know how long I was going to be in there. Right? So I had a full-blown panic attack. Right? Well, next day, I go into a bathroom, like one of those single-stall bathrooms. And I go to leave and I do the knob. And it didn't give right away, right? It was like still locked or something. In that moment, the full panic attack came back to me. It just shot through my body, right? After that, I got on an elevator. The elevator closed. It made a weird noise. Full panic attack, shock, all through my body. So suddenly, all these things are sending me into panic. Anything like that's enclosed, like think nothing that would bother me, right? So, you know, we went vacation and like I was starting to realize because one of the things I know is that when you have panic attacks avoiding the things that cause you panic attacks then turns to acrophobia and actually ends up being worse than the panic attacks because right? you start avoiding things like oh I'm not going anywhere where I have to get an elevator or oh I'm not going anything with with, with one person bathrooms <laughs> oh I can't go to the bathroom on a plane right I'm gonna be on planes right so the world starts getting smaller and smaller and smaller I was like I can't let my world get smaller and smaller and smaller so we were in this hotel with an elevator, and I just kept getting on the elevator. I'm like, awareness, balance, soft core, go down. Get back on the elevator, 
awareness about the software. Feel the, you know, and just let the, just let it, you know, the heart rate pound, right? But then I would still get, it. So, so I was like, okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm going to still feel the feelings, but I'm not going to avoid the elevator. It gave me a sense of like power that I can be in the elevator. It's still like those surges of panic would come. But I wouldn't let it, you know, stop me or control me. And then we go on vacation like three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and the and the we get stuck. We get, the, elevator. the elevator <laughs> gets stuck <laughs> and it's overpacked. It's a tiny elevator. Oh God! <laughs> and I was like, oh, this won't open. And they're calling the the front desk. They're, we're hitting the the button that's going to a call center somewhere in the state i don't know and, and we have no idea how long it's going to be there I'm just, just, and for some reason you know like that little awareness it went about here and that was what felt safe like oh here it is here am i i'm in this moment i don't know how long this moment's going to last but i'm centered so it's like okay i didn't panic i didn't even have the racing heart rate <clears throat> so super super useful. Yeah, it is. No. You're doing great. You got uh so we got tons minutes. of time. I got more things I could do. <laughs> do we want to pause for any questions? Um one question. Yeah. So um this is a limitation of my ability to put thoughts into language. Uh how soft is software? Are you experimenting with that? Like what seems to actually center me better is if I have like Tone. Like I'm not tensing muscle, but I have them engaged. And if I like, take my core and like maximally relax, it actually feels worse. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if this is a common thing. Or well, so so it, it, one of the things that I talk about is like that that opening, right? Because sometimes when people have been chronically tensing something and they go to relax it, those emotions that were happening when they first responded start coming back, and you're like, oh, this doesn't feel. I think we're talking about. I think we're talking about slightly different things, but maybe I'll have to think about how I'm phrasing well, it. Yeah, it might. It might be one of those things to, to play with, too, right? Because it, there is also that thing. It's like you're working with your soft core and your spine, right? Like there is a balance point where you don't have to exert a lot of muscle strain, right? And and what a lot of people don't realize is that their pelvises are um, turned so that they're not getting the best alignment. So actually find, like, there's a whole practice around, let's try standing up straight. And you notice that most people when they stand up straight are actually doing the thing that creates more work rather than less work because they don't actually know how to get proper alignment. So it might be also one of those things is to get that alignment so that a soft core actually does feel good. So it might be one of those things that requires some some attention and some experimentation to, to find, you know? Because like I said, a lot of this stuff isn't easy, you know? I'm noticing your legs are more together. So for me to get comfortable in that balance, I have to have a little bit more gap. Like I, I can't, it's very challenging to relax if I'm standing in. Right, you, you don't have a, a, yeah, yeah, a strong have, base. That's right. This is actually not balanced. This is not good structural integrity. You know, this is, and I don't know if you want to play with this, like, when you think about the pelvis, it's like a, a it tilts, you can tilt forward, makes an arch, backwards, it's a slump, right? And so as you, you know, most people, like, when you think about, like, where's, where's your hip? Like, mm -hmm. But actually, your joint is where your, where your leg moves. That's your hip. When you're rotating this, that's the pelvis that's rotating. You can a lot of times see that like you do a cat cow, mm -hmm. right? A lot of times people have a harder time finding it. But there's a point in that rotation where you go from arched, perfectly splintered, bow. When you can find the perfectly centered where you're sitting right on top of the, the pelvis, every, there does, you don't have to like, you know that stand up straight, or throw your shoulders yeah. back. That's creating more work. Lots of people tilt their heads back. They don't. They actually don't recognize where the occiput creates that sense of centeredness. 
So there's there's a lot of ways in around. So if you're if there's could be a couple of different explanations if something doesn't feel right, you have to work through it. And and it's it's all in each step. It's about gaining that somatic awareness. Like what is, what does what does a what is the right position? What does it feel like for my pelvis to really support my spine? Because mm -hmm. if I've been constantly holding it a tilt because of you know previous you know, stress reactions, mm -hmm. then it's going to feel weird. It's going to take some time to find that that place of strength. So I have a question about mm -hmm. the spine centering. <laughs> Is it something I can do to tell someone else to calm down? To <laughs> well, here's subject. what I would say. You know, when we talk about like techniques to resolve conflict or help, like, so if you're centered, that is the number one thing you can do to help someone else calm down because there's this co regulation, right? If you can be receptive to what they're sending you without you being activated, that's going to make the biggest difference. Now, you could do the instructions that I gave you. But probably they're not going to be receptive to the instructions until they're calm enough to start being in the learning zone. Okay. So yeah, it's like it's actually really hard to maintain anger, upset around a person who's you know really really centered. I find if I take a deep breath, it's very common for somebody else to take a deeper deeper breath, whether it's deep, but the very act of. Oh. And then they're the breathing kind of. It's kind of like a yawn. It's contagious. Yeah. These, these body states can be contagious. We are about at our time limit, a minute or two left. But. Okay, well, maybe we, we don't have time to do the other exercises necessarily, but there's a sequence of exercises to kind of point to some other somatic awareness. Yeah. Right? So one is like when we do like do a pushing exercise. Mm -hmm. The point is to realize that your ability, your strength, like actually gets um, weakened whenever you're contracted. Whether that's like you raise your eyebrows, oh, it's a startle response. My strength goes down. I'm angry. I'm mad at you. That's a form of contraction. Your strength goes down. A lot of people think it's the opposite. And I think that's one of the big points of like keto is that it's counterintuitive. A lot of the things that you think you should do to be strong are making you weak. And the things that actually make you effective are, are very much the opposite. So, so one of the um, practices has to do with like, I don't know if we have time to do this. Do you want to do this with me quick, Gary? Okay, but I already it. Well, so it's, remember that one where I said, don't, don't let me pull you across this line? Okay. Right? Don't pull. So what happens? I try to pull you across the line. Right? I, I contract, right? Right. So now do the same to me. Like, don't let. <laughs> okay, now, now at first that's like, oh, that's a trick. You're cheating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, verbally you didn't let me pull you across uh -huh. the line. Right? But if we change it, it's not about pulling across the line, it's about controlling. Like, don't let me control you. Right? So even if you know, there's the instinct. Mm -hmm. Right? Now if we do it the other way, try to control me. Okay. So there's this. Oh. <laughs> right, exactly. So what's interesting is like, a keto is full of all these maneuvers. Mm -hmm. And you flow with the other person. Right? Really hard to learn because your instinct says go the other way. Right? A lot of what we did in that class, that's really cool. But one of the things is that okay. he was leading us it's through this. One, yeah. And he's like, I'm not going to teach you any Aikido moves. Let's just work on this. How do you feel the other person? Feel the other person and just move with them. Right? And what we found out is that in the process of just, oh, I'm just trying to, we, we learned every a keto maneuver to get away from somebody, right? Because it just naturally happens. If you start feeling in to what's the direction and going with the direction, then you take control of the situation. Will you two co-teach a class next year? Sure. Please.
swing dancing and then personal <laughs> boundaries. Like that's that, that that's all. Oh, sorry. Okay. That's right. Oh, swing Aikido. Yes, yeah. so, swing Aikido. So I covered like all of these dimensions except for this one. Okay. That was direction. But there's this thing called intention or wanting. And I brought I brought my friend here as a prop. So we'll try this real quick and see if this works. Sometimes it's hard to get. But um, so Groot, baby Groot can grant any wish you have. All you have to do is get it from me. Okay. So before I say go, you get it. Start with really wanting this baby Groot. Like this intention is very strong. I want this baby group. And so now notice what happened in your body as you wanted the baby group. Could anybody feel anything? My heart rate, I got a little more like surges, I guess I'd say. But there was some tightening in that one. Wait, am I the one who like loosened? Was there any sense of like there's a direction to the wanting? Yeah. Yes. Well, like it's aimed. Like if we watch you, you, there's something that's happening in your muscle. Oh, there's just a little bit there. It's like a yeah. priming. I want this. It's a sensation. I can feel it. All right. Mm -hmm. Nope. Well, let's try something a little weird. So everybody stand where you can kind of move one arm. Mm -hmm. All right. So move one arm up like this. Now move it about half as much. And then half of that. And then half of that. And then just half of that. Come to where it's like that. <coughs> move it. Now, kind of with that intention, do the same thing. But don't move your arm. Just intend to move your arm up all the way. And then half. Than half that. So you can feel that your intention can move independent of your arm. Mm -hmm. Now do both at the same time. Give me your intention and your arm at the same. Does that feel any different? Very. I've got a question with this, but I'm intending to do it, but I know that I'm not. It's way different. Is it supposed to be like a lot of ending that I know that I'm not going to? Remember, these are experiments. So the, if the answer has to be what did you actually experience? Like you said, it felt way different. How would you describe how it felt different? Um, it, there was a vibrating almost. Like I want to do it, and I was, but I wasn't. So there was a, almost a push pull in my arm. Not quite the active, but it, the vibration, so the flow kind of jammed up. Mm -hmm. Did anybody feel that it wasn't different at all? Like they didn't get it? Mm -hmm. Little bit? Yeah, no, I agree. Oh, you did get it. Okay. So there is a time where your intention like can move independent of your body, like when you wanted the root. Mm -hmm. Or when you're moving your arm. But there's times where it's all per it's aligned. They're mm -hmm. moving together. Right? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that there could be times where they're not moving together. They may be moving in the opposite direction, mm -hmm. right? Like you, I'm saying, you know, go there, but at the same time, you're still really wanting the group. Well, the thing, I mean, you do more experiments, but the thing you notice is that when your intention and your movement is not aligned, you're much weaker. Your capacity to be effective is diminished. And when you start to able to distinguish somatically, what is my intention doing? What is the direction? Also, what's the shape of it? You can find that you can start to play with it. Like what happens when I change the shape of it? I change the direction. Like um, also like you're struggling with something. Well, what, what's the <laughs> intention that's happening? Well, I don't want to do it. <laughs> yes, right? I wanna. I don't wanna do it. Well, what we've done is we just operationalized wanting. So, okay, now, how do you want? Like, I move my attention that direction. I align with my movement. And suddenly I'm effective where I was stopped before. 
like a lot of times we're not distinguishing what's happening in the intention. Like we, like I, you know, he said to me, you know, this works for anything. And I said, well, I really hate writing. I can't sit down and get myself to write. And he goes, okay, that's a challenge. So sit down and start to write and tell me what you notice, what, what's happening in our somatic dimensions. And I was like, okay, sitting here, a little hunched yeah. over, I'm not balanced, feeling tight. Oh, you know that that intention? I feel it coming from right here, and it's going right there, like out the door. Right. Allow yourself to have that balance, feel it out, and then move that intention right here. And let's play with what the shape of the intention is. Is it narrow and pointy, or is it wide? Just notice how does that feel? I was like, oh, if I feel it up here instead of down here, and it's going this way towards my computer, in line with my hands, I'm 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 ready to go. Right? It it changed my feeling. I realized that I don't want to was something I was not wanting was something. Oh, that was um that was a distinction I wanted to put out. Um, like some things are voluntary. You can think of it. Some things are involuntary. Right? Is breathing voluntary or involuntary? Yes. Right? So what I would call that is awareness mediated voluntary. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, well, it's not voluntary, but the moment I'm aware of it, I now I now can choose. Right? Well, it's the same thing, like this intention is a physical thing. It's operational. We can talk about it, we can feel it. But if we're unaware of it, we don't have a lot of choice. So the moment I was able to distinguish it in my body, I now had choice. Oh, I could choose to want to do this. And wanting to do something felt very different than not wanting oh, to do something. Uh, yeah. right? Sitting in my chair with my intention <clears throat> going that direction felt completely different in my body. And I was able to shift it because I was able to distinguish the somatic experience. And now I had choice because it's awareness mediated voluntary experience. So just if we can real quickly. So so I put in these categories. There's aligning things, the posture, intention, direction, they're aligned. And then there's expanding things. The muscle, the breath, the focus. Right? If if we were going to kind of come up with some words to describe what it feels like when you're aligned, or what state of being that is, what does it feel like when you're Expanded. It's it being what kind of words? Would you use? Like I think I've lost my focus. Okay. <laughs> so, honestly, a line feels like I don't know, like a nice cup of tea. You're really enjoying it. You like all the textures of it. Expanded sort of feels like I don't know. It's like the opposite of like a rubber balloon animal. It feels like all the tension is gone. It feels wide and spacious and floating. So as we got deeper into it and experienced it more, mm -hmm. the kind of things that I experience and the most people experience is that, oh, this feels like acceptance, right? This mm -hmm. feels like embracing, welcoming. welcoming, right? This feels strong. This feels powerful. When, when I'm aligned in my direction, I make things happen. Okay. Right? Yeah. When this, it feels like love. Right? And we had one exercise with, like, how do you give baby group to somebody with love. What What's the operational experience of love? What is love like in your body? Mm -hmm. right? And so kind of what we're going to is like, if it started with the de definition of embodied peacemaking, mm -hmm. but now the definition of embodied, me embodied <coughs> peacemaking is creating an integrated state of love and power in your body. And that's the thing, it's like, it's the keto, it's like, oh, we don't have to choose between being powerful. Power is corrupting. Power, you know, is, is hardening. It disconnects you from your unity. No, actually, when you're contracted, when you're angry, when you're hardened, you weaken yourself. Right? That in a lot of ways, operationally in your body, love and power are the same thing. So we're building this integrated state of Thank
Here we go. We're hitting dinner time, aren't we?